Well, we are in the process of studying the fourth trumpet. We're on a roll, aren't we? Yes. It's only the second day, and we're already uh, finishing the fourth trumpet. Uh, but don't be too confident, because uh, number five and six are going to take us a long period of time, and uh, then we have several other things that we're going to be dealing with as well. So we are on page 107. Uh, we read those quotations on page 107. And uh, we noticed that during the period of papal supremacy, uh, there was darkness. It's called the Dark Ages. Why? Because the sun was eclipsed, the moon was eclipsed, and the stars were also eclipsed. And of course, the sun represents whom? Christ. The moon represents the scriptures, and the stars represent God's people. And, uh, you know, we were reading statements from the chapter in Great Controversy, An Era of Spiritual Darkness. That, that title itself of the chapter about papal supremacy says a lot. Now, I'm not going to read all the statements under this section because we have a lot of material to cover, but I want to highlight certain words beginning on page 107, the words that I have um, underlined and in bold. Do you notice the number of times that you have dark, dark ages, darkness deeper, deepened, then a little bit farther down, the prince of darkness, and then the suppression of the scriptures. So the darkness comes because uh, the scriptures are proscribed or suppressed. Then at the bottom of the page, as time goes by, darkness seemed to what? To what? To grow more dense. On the next page, the advancing centuries witnessed the constant increase of what? Of error. In the next statement, which is describing the 13th century, uh, it uses the expression, the prince of darkness. And uh, uh, let's read the one from Great Controversy, page 60. But the noon of the papacy was what? The midnight of the world, is the description of the period of papal supremacy. Why was it the midnight of the world? Ellen White states, the holy scriptures were almost what? Unknown not only to the people, but to the priests. Like the Pharisees of old, the papal leaders hated the light which would reveal their sins. And then the next statement, at the, at the very bottom of the statement, you have the banishing of the Word of God. Uh, Great Controversy, page 586, the iniquity and spiritual darkness that prevailed under the supremacy of Rome were the inevitable result of her suppression of what? Of the Scriptures. And, um, you know, you can notice uh, at the top of the next page, uh, you have a mention of the Holy Scriptures, ignorance of the Holy Scriptures. The Bible would exalt God and place finite men in their true uh, position. Uh, the Bible was concealed and suppressed. The circulation of the Bible was prohibited. So, in other words, the, the, during this period, people did not catch a glimpse of Jesus because the lesser light was hidden and was suppressed. Uh, the next statement speaks about um, William Miller uh, studying the scriptures. He sa it says the scriptures were carefully searched, and what happened as a result? Light poured in upon the darkness. And then uh, the last statement that we have on this page uh, has to do with the end times. Let's read that. Dear brethren and sisters, as error is fast progressing, we should seek to be awakened the cause of God and realize the time in which we live. Darkness is to cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. Nearly all around us are being enveloped in thick darkness. What is the thick darkness? Error and what? Delusion. Is that the case during the, during the period of papal supremacy? Yes. It becomes us to shake off stupidity and live near to God, where we can draw divine what? rays of light and glory from the countenance of Jesus. As darkness thickens and error increases, so notice darkness is related to uh, error, we should obtain a more thorough knowledge of the truth and be prepared to maintain our position from where? From the scriptures. And then at the top of page 110, Ellen White quotes Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, they are in what? They're in darkness. 
uh, the people of God are directed where? To the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the, the delusive power of spirits of darkness. So how is the darkness dispelled? The darkness is dispelled by the scriptures, by the lesser light that leads to whom? That leads to Jesus, the greater light. Now let's talk about how the papacy darkened the sun and moon. We know that that was by the suppression of the scriptures, but let's be a little bit more specific. In order to understand the darkening of the sun and the moon during the fourth trumpet, we need to study the daily that the little horn took away from the prince of the host. And that should be fresh in your minds because two Sabbaths ago, we were studying Daniel 8 in our Sabbath school lessons. Remember that the little horn attacked the prince of the host and he attacked the host and he took away the daily? Now let's pursue this. It is difficult to interpret the word daily unless we go to other places in the Bible to explain what this word means. The word is an adjective and in Daniel 8 it has no noun to qualify it. So the question is, the little horn took away the daily what? You know, the word sacrifice isn't there. The meaning of the word tamid in Hebrew is simply something which goes on continuously without interruption. That's what the word tamid means. However, what is it in Daniel 8 that goes on continuously without interruption? Uh, now, you remember that the little horn of Daniel 8 represents what power? The papacy. The same power that's being described in the fourth trumpet, right? Now, it is important to keep in mind that the word tamid, daily, has the definite article. It is not simply daily, it is the daily. It is a specific daily that is taken away by the little horn. Uh, as I mentioned before, the King James Version translators uh, added the word sacrifice, uh, but Ellen White uh, has this statement in early writings, page 74 and 75, where she, she wrote, Then I saw in relation to the daily of Daniel 8 verse 12, that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. Now, Heidi Hikes, uh, whom I mentioned before, wrote an entire book on this issue of the daily. There are two views. One is that the daily is paganism that was taken away. The other view is the view that I'm going to share, which I believe that fits better with the context of what we're studying here. So at the bottom of page 110, what then does this word mean? What does the word daily mean? We must allow other Old Testament texts to explain what the word means. The Old Testament, when we examine other verses, clearly indicates that this word refers to the daily ministration of the priest in the court of the sanctuary and in the holy place of the sanctuary. And by the way, you know, because it's dealing with the sanctuary, you have to interpret the word daily in the context of the sanctuary, right? So this means that the little horn was going to attempt to take away from the prince, that is from Jesus, the prince of the host, his ministration where? In the court and in the holy place of the sanctuary. Now in order to comprehend how the little horn did this, we need to answer two fundamental questions. The first question is, in which sanctuary did the prince minister at this point in the vision of Daniel 8 and also during the period of the fourth trumpet? In which sanctuary was the prince, who is Jesus, ministering? Some earthly sanctuary? No, there was no earthly sanctuary. The second uh, question that we must answer is, what does each piece of furniture in the court and in the holy place represent? What did the altar of sacrifice, the candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense represent? What did they symbolize, in other words? Well, let's look for the answer to the first question. Who is the prince? Well, let's go to Joshua chapter 5 
in verses 13 through 15. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Here, Israel is about to conquer Jericho. They have it surrounded. And uh, Joshua is on the outskirts of Jericho, and this majestic warrior shows up. And uh, let's read about it in verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord. Now you don't catch the connection with Daniel 8, but there are only two places where you have the expression Prince of the Host, which is translated here, Commander of the Lord's army. It's the identical Hebrew expression. So it's the same prince in Joshua as in Daniel 8. So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth. And what? Was this a warrior God? If he wasn't God, well, Joshua is practicing idolatry, isn't he? And said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Where other, what other place in Scripture do we find a command to take off the sandals? Moses. In chapter 3 of Exodus, where Moses is commanded because he's in the presence of God. So who is the prince of the host? The prince of the host is none other than Jesus Christ. Now the question is, where was Jesus serving as Prince of the Host during the period of the little horn of Daniel 8 and the fourth trumpet of the book of Revelation? Well, let's pursue this. Matthew 21, 12 and 13 describes the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on what Christians call Palm Sunday. We're told there that He entered the temple of God and he called the temple what? My Father's house. So when he enters, it's called the temple of God, and he says that it is my Father's house. However, a short while later, in chapter 23, the last two verses, Jesus now leaves the temple, and as he's leaving, he says to the Jewish leaders, Your house is left unto you desolate. In other words, the Shekinah had left, and the temple was doomed. Now because the Jewish nation rejected Christ, in AD 70, as we've studied, the Romans destroyed the Jerusalem temple, and it has never been rebuilt. In other words, during the period of the fourth trumpet, there was no Jewish temple. In other, uh, that's very clear. For this reason, it is not possible to conclude that the sanctuary that the little horn trampled upon the, uh, during the Christian era was the Jerusalem temple, because there was no Jerusalem temple to trample. During the Christian dispensation, when the little horn did its work, there was no earthly Jerusalem temple in existence. However, if the little horn did not do its work in the Jerusalem temple, then, where did it do its work? The answer is twofold. First, upon his ascension, Jesus began his ministry as high priest, where? In the literal heavenly sanctuary, personally and what? Physically. He is the genuine high priest who ministers in the literal heavenly temple, on the literal Mount Zion in the literal heavenly Jerusalem, correct? He is the minister of a better covenant because he presents before his Father his own better blood that runs where? Does he, does he literally present his blood? You better believe it. It runs through his veins. He says, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Second point, Jesus is also minister in the spiritual temple on earth. The spiritual temple is a reflection of the heavenly temple. And that temple on earth is what? 
the Christian church. This spiritual temple has spiritual foundations, it has a spiritual cornerstone, it has spiritual building stones, and a spiritual Shekinah, which is what? The invisible Holy Spirit. Are you following me or not? Did the Apostle Paul identify the church as the temple on earth, a spiritual temple? All you have to do is read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. He clearly identifies the church as the temple. In other words, Jesus ministers in two places at the same time, physically in heaven and spiritually on earth through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. His heavenly hosts are the angels, and His earthly hosts are His faithful followers. Is this making sense? So what does Daniel 8 mean when it states that the little horn took away the daily from the prince and killed his hosts? Obviously it cannot mean that the little horn literally and personally traveled to heaven and deposed Jesus, <laughs> and that he destroyed the heavenly hosts which are the angels. Certainly cannot mean that. What then does it mean? We find the answer in Daniel 8 and verse 11 where the text tells us that the little horn, this is important, cast down the place of the prince's sanctuary to the earth. In other words, instead of the heavenly sanctuary, the little horn transfers it to a, the place on earth. We have already identified the place as the prince's sanctuary in the literal heavenly temple and in his church on earth. The word place, makon in Hebrew, is unusual. There are some very common words in the Old Testament for place that are used multiple times, but this is not one of those common words. This word is used 17 times in the Hebrew Bible, and in 16 of those 17 references it denotes the heavenly sanctuary as God's dwelling place. Now, Perhaps it would be good to consider some of these references. Now this is a long passage, but it's very important, so I'm going to take the time to read it. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verses 37 through 50, and I want you to catch the, the relationship here between what is happening in heaven and what is happening on earth. It says there, when there is famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, when their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague or whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone, or by all your people Israel, when each one knows the plague of his own heart, and spreads out his hand toward this temple, speaking about the literal earthly temple, right? Toward this temple, then, wait a minute, no, so they pray towards the earthly temple, but what? Then here in heaven, your dwelling place, that's the word makon. And what does God do when He hears the prayer in the heavenly temple that is uttered toward the earthly temple? And what? Forgive and act, and give to everyone according to all his ways whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all of the sons of men that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this temple, which temple? They pray toward the earthly temple, right? But God hears where? Here in heaven. Your dwelling place, there's Makon again, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. Verse 44, when your people go out to battle against their enemy, wherever you send them, and when they pray to the Lord toward the city, notice they're praying toward the city, you have chosen, and the temple which I have built for your name, then hear where? Here in heaven, their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. When they sin against you, for there's no one who does not sin, 
and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to the land of the enemy, far or near, yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive, and what? And repent, and make supplication to whom? To you. to you in the land of those who took them captive, saying, We have sinned and done wrong, we have committed wickedness. And when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who led them away captive, and pray to you, where? Toward this land which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the temple which I have built for your name. Where does God hear? Then here in heaven, your dwelling place. There's Macon, third time. Here in heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. And what happens? What does God do from the heavenly temple? And forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions which they, have, which they have transgressed against you, and grant them what? What comes from the heavenly temple? Forgiveness and what? Compassion before those who took them captive, captive, that they may have compassion on them. Long passage, but very interesting. People pray to the earthly temple, but they're really receiving an answer from where? From the God who is in heaven. There is a paradox in this passage. Although God's people utter their prayers toward the earthly temple, God hears their prayers and answers from heaven. Notice also 1 Kings 8 verse 30. Hear the plea of your servant and your people Israel when they pray toward this place. But where does God hear? Oh, here in heaven, your dwelling place. Once again, Makon. Heed and what? Forgive. Heed and forgive. Thus, the conclusion is, there is an intimate connection between the earthly and heavenly temples. In a sense, God dwells in both. For our purposes here, it is important to remember that when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the Jerusalem temple, he was not able to touch the heavenly temple, right? So the earthly antichrist, is he able to interfere with the earthly, uh, with the earthly functions? Yes, but is he able to interfere with the ministry of Christ in the heavenly temple? Absolutely not. In a similar fashion, the little horn was able to take over the sanctuary functions from the prince and kill his hosts on earth. But he was not able to take away the functions of the priest in heaven, nor destroy his angels. The act of casting down the place of the prince's sanctuary does not mean that the little horn demolished mortar and stones of the heavenly sanctuary. The meaning is that the little horn usurped and placed on earth the daily or continual ministration of the heavenly prince. In other words, that which belonged to the prince in heaven, the little horn usurped and what? And set up on earth. He changes the place of the sanctuary, in other words. Significantly, at this point in the flow of Christian history, the little horn, this is an important point, attempted to interfere mainly with what? With the daily ministry of the prince in the court and in the holy place. This is understandable because during that period, Jesus had not yet what? Jesus had not yet entered the most holy place. So the little horn mainly interferes with the, holy, with, uh, the court and the holy ministration. The central issue then is who will control the sanctuary service in the court and in the holy place? The prince or the little horn? Why is control of the sanctuary such, a con such an important and vital issue? We find the answers to these questions by considering the meaning of the altar of sacrifice in the court and the candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense in the holy place. So now we're going to take a look at the furniture that was in the sanctuary to understand in what sense the, the place of the sanctuary is cast down and the earthly uh, little horn takes over the functions of the heavenly prince. Morning and evening, let's talk about the altar of sacrifice. Morning and evening, the priest offered a lamb upon the altar of sacrifice in the court for the sins of Israel. As long as the Hebrew sanctuary stood, 
There was never a time when the fire of the sacrifice was not burning. It burnt continually. This was the daily burnt offering. Notice as an example Exodus 29 and verse 39. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day what? Same word as in Daniel 8, continually, tamid, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb, lamb you shall offer at twilight. The sacrifice of the lamb, of course, represented what? The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The priest offered the sacrifice daily, morning and evening, thus indicating that the death of Christ has enduring value. He died how many times? Once for all, and never needs to die again. The book of Hebrews makes this clear. Hebrews 7, 26 and 27, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did what? Once for all when he offered up himself. So the sacrifice of Christ was what? The daily indicates he was offered once for all, and that sacrifice is a value for everyone all, for all time. Notice Hebrews 9, 25 and 26 from the King James Version. Not yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must, uh, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, how many times? Once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was what? Once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So how many times was Jesus going to die? He was only going to die once for all. Now how did the little horn hide this fact that Jesus had died once for all? Well, in the middle of the page we have the answer. The Roman Catholic dogma of the sacrifice of the Mass counterfeits the once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. According to Roman Catholic theology, according to the dogma, the priest sacrifices Jesus repeatedly in every Mass. Instead of looking to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and presents His own blood before the Father, the Roman Catholic Church teaches believers to look at the wafer host and supposedly the real body of Jesus is found there. It's called the ubiquity of the, of the presence of Christ. Instead of coming boldly to Jesus at the throne of grace in heaven to claim His once for all and sufficient sacrifice, Roman Catholic priests teach that the faithful, teach the faithful that the host nourishes them because they are feeding on the literal body of Jesus and drinking His literal blood. In fact, the priests store the host in a flower-like artifact called the tabernacle. At the center of the artifact is the circular wafer host, and coming forth from the edges of the host are the rays of the sun. When the priest brings the tabernacle before the congregation, this is important, which contains the host, he teaches the members to bow and worship the host. This is simply a deceitful form of sun worship. Furthermore, the Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic theology teaches that the priest on earth takes over the power and prerogatives of Jesus Christ. When the priest pronounces the words of consecration, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, the wafer, according to Catholic theology, is no longer a wafer, but it is rather the real physical body of Jesus. Roman Catholic theology teaches that when these words are pronounced, the earthly priest 
has the power to transubstantiate the wafer into the real body of Jesus Christ. That is to say, the earthly priest supposedly has the power to create his creator. This is blasphemy to the fullest degree. St. Alphonsus Liguori, one of the 33 doctors of the Roman Catholic Church in the history of the church, wrote about the transubstantiating power that the Roman Catholic Church believes the priest has. This is in, in his book, The Dignity and Duties of the Priest or Selva, page 33 and 34. Thus the priest may, in a certain manner, be called the creator of his creator, since by saying the words of consecration, he creates, as it were, Jesus in the sacrament, by giving him a sacramental existence and produces him as a victim to be offered to the Eternal Father. As in creating the, wor creating the world, it was sufficient for God to have said, Let it be made, and it was created. He spoke, and they were made. So it is sufficient for the, for the priest to say, Hoc est corpus meum, and behold, the bread is no longer bread, but the body of Jesus Christ. The power of the priest, says St. Bernardine of Siena, is the power of the divine person, for the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. Is that blasphemy? Yes. Does it hide the once for all sacrifice of Christ? Yes, because Jesus is presenting himself in heaven, his blood before the Father, and where are people looking? They're not looking to heaven, they're looking on earth. They're looking at, at, at a host. They think, that they think they're being nourished by the physical body of Jesus. It totally hides the work of Jesus, the greater light in the heavenly sanctuary. Now what about the table of showbread? Well, as you know, the table of showbread contained two stacks of bread, two stacks of six loaves on each, uh, on each side of the table. And uh, what did the 12 lobes represent? Well, it represented that there was sufficient bread to nourish all of Israel, which had 12 tribes. Now, this bread is called the Tamid bread, the continual bread. Numbers 4 and verse 7, I'm reading from the King James Version because it's translated continual, it's the word Tamid. Let's read there. And upon the table of showbread they shall spread a cloth of blue and put thereon the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and covers to cover withal and what else? The continual bread shall be thereon. Now what does the bread represent? The bread represents the Word of God, right? Yes. So let's notice some texts. Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes from my mouth. So what does the bread of the eater represent? So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. So what does the bread represent? the word that comes out of the mouth of God. Notice Matthew 4 verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, that is by physical bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what did the bread on the table of the showbread represent? It represents the word of God. The number 12 indicates that it's sufficient to feed all of God's people indicated by the number 12. Now, after Jesus fed the 5,000 with only five loaves of bread and two fishes, he made a very controversial remark. In John 6, verse 53, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Roman Catholics use this text to show that in each Mass people literally partake of the body and the priest, of course, of the blood of Jesus. Is this what Jesus really meant? 
that his literal body and blood nourish the members of the church? Absolutely not. In context, Jesus explained what he meant in John 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. That doesn't profit you at all to eat the flesh of Jesus. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are what? Life. So partaking of Christ is not literally partaking of His body and His blood. It simply means that we partake of His what? Of His word. What did the papacy do with the word of God during the 1260 years? Eclipsed it, right? So we have, to, we have to relate Daniel 8 with the fourth trumpet because they cover the same period. That is to say, the words of Jesus have power to nourish our spiritual life. As literal bread sustains physical life, the Word of God sustains spiritual life. Spiritually speaking, when we study the Word, we assimilate whom? Jesus. And He becomes flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones, spiritually speaking. The ingested word of God cleanses our life and gives us the victory over sin. David understood this when he wrote in verses that are very well known, Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11. How can a young man cleanse his way? When the Bible uses the word way, symbolically it means conduct or behavior. So how can a young man cleanse his behavior? How can he do it? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, in the Roman Catholic Church, they believe that just by partaking of the little host, you know, because that's the real literal body of Jesus, it nourishes you spiritually. Is that what, what is being taught by the showbread? No, absolutely not. What is it that nourishes us? It's the Word of God. Was the Word of God scarce during the period of papal dominion? Absolutely. Notice John 15 verse 3. It's the Word that cleanses. You, Jesus says to His disciples, you are already what? Clean. How were they made clean? You are already clean because of the Word which I have spoken to you. It's the Word that cleanses. The bread, the spiritual bread, the Word. Notice Ephesians chapter 5, 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. For what reason? That He might sanctify and cleanse her with what? With the washing of water by the Word. So does a little host nourish us? No, the little host doesn't nourish us. What nourishes us? It's the spiritual bread, the Word of God. And during the period of the fourth trumpet, the Word of God was eclipsed. The two witnesses witnessed in darkness or in obscurity. Eating a literal wafer certainly has no power to spiritually feed and transform us. The ingested Word of God cleanses our lives from sin. So what does the table of the showbread teach us? There are at least three lessons. One, the bread represents Jesus as contained where? In the written Word of God. The bread is continually available for all of God's people. And finally, if assimilated, the Word will nourish our spiritual life and provide victory over sin. In what sense did the little horn cast down the meaning of the table of the showbread? That's the question. The answer is not difficult to find. The Roman Catholic Church substituted what? Traditions and philosophies of men in place of the Word of God. The word of a supposedly infallible magisterium or teaching office of men took the place of a thus saith the Lord. The number of unbiblical, unbiblical and anti-biblical traditions in Roman Catholicism is legion. Here are some of them that are ne never found in the Bible. 
purgatory, limbo, celibacy, auricular confession, the immortality of the soul, an eternally burning hell, Lent, processions, the mass, relics, canonization of saints, the rosary, bowing before images, the immaculate conception, the assumption of Mary, baptism of infants by aspersion, novenas, the observance of Sunday. You want me to continue? <laughs> what did the papacy do with the Word of God? Totally obscured the Word of God. And because it obscured the lesser light, people could not see what? They could not see the work of the greater light in the heavenly sanctuary. What was the result of these traditions replacing the Word of God? Spiritual what? Malnutrition and moral laxity that made the pagan Romans look like saints. It is no coincidence that the third and fourth seals of Revelation describe this period as famine for the Word of God. Now we're not studying the seals, but in the seals there's a tremendous scarcity of bread because wheat and barley are exorbitantly expensive, 8 to 16 times more expensive than before under the third seal. So let's continue here. In effect, during the period of the third horse, that's the period of Constantine, the church assimilated the unbiblical teachings and practices of the pagans, and as a result, under the fourth horse, uh, the period of papal dominion was a life-threatening scarcity of bread. Now, this is also true of the period of the fourth church of Revelation. See, fourth trumpet, fourth, sea, four, fourth church. Under this church, who is mentioned as uh, being in the church and influencing the church? Jezebel. What happened during the period of Jezebel in the Old Testament? It didn't rain. It didn't rain for how long? Three and a half years. For how long did it not rain when spiritual Jezebel ruled during the church of Thyatira? Three and a half years. But not literal years, what? Symbolic years. Time, times, and the dividing of time. So what was literal in the Old Testament becomes symbolic during the 1260 years. So are you understanding this? Now, what about the candlestick? We've talked about the altar of sacrifice. We've talked about uh, the uh, table of the showbread. What about the candlestick? According to Leviticus 24, 1 through 4, one of the roles of the high priest was to trim the wicks and to replenish the oil in the seventh branch, seven branched candlestick in the holy place. Thus he would make sure that the light of the candlestick burned what? Tamid, continually. Let's read Leviticus 24, 1 through 4. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light, to make the lamps burn what? Tamid continually. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord. What's the next word? Tamid, continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord. Once again, Tamid, continually. What did the seven branched candlestick symbolize? Well, let's interpret the symbols. The number seven represents what? Totality or fullness. So the seven candlesticks represent the totality of the history of the Christian church. The oil is a symbol of what? Of the Holy Spirit. And the candlesticks, where the oil goes in so that the candlesticks give light, represents what? Represents the seven churches. And the seven churches are seven what? Seven periods of church history. Now let's notice Revelation 1 verse 20 where that makes this clear. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, that is the messengers, and the seven lampstands which you saw are what? The seven churches. Now notice Ellen White's explanation of the seven lamps. It says there in um, Acts of the Apostles page 585, the names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates what? Completeness. And is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time. So they're covered from the apostolic period till the end of time, the fullness of church history in other words. 
She continues, while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. Thus the candlestick represents the witness of the church to the world through the power of the Holy Spirit in different periods of Christian history. The period of papal dominion was one of what? Darkness. The light of the church shone but dimly, for it was the dark ages. At times it looked like the light of the church was going to be extinguished, particularly during the period of Thyatira, the light burned dim. So are you following me? Yes. Now what about the golden altar of incense? Did the papacy also blur and hide the meaning of the altar of incense? Especially, yes. The altar of incense is, of incense is also called the Tamid altar of incense. The, the incense was to be presented continually morning and evening. Let's read Luke, and some of this we covered before, so we don't have to cover all of the details. Uh, in Luke chapter 1 and verses 8 through 11, uh, you have Zechariah serving in the temple. And it says, so, uh, so it was that while he, that is Zechariah, was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So notice that the people are praying and Zechariah is offering the incense. Now what does that represent? That represents the fact that we pray and who receives our prayers and mingles them with, his, with the merits of his, of his uh, perfect life? Jesus does, right? Psalm 141 and verse 2 also explain, relates the incense to the prayers of the saints. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. We read the introductory scene to the trumpets. It says in uh, Revelation 8, 3 and 4, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar that was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. I read this statement before, but it's so beautiful I've got to read it again. Review and Herald, October 30, 1900. There is an inexhaustible fund of what? Of perfect obedience accruing from his obedience. So is there an inexhaustible fund? Yeah. Based on what? On His obedience. In heaven, His merits, His self-denial and self-sacrifice are treasured up as incense to be offered up with the prayers of His people as the sinner's sincere, humble prayers ascend to the throne of God. What does Jesus do? Christ mingles with them the merits of His life of perfect obedience. Our prayers are made fragrant by this incense Christ has pledged Himself to intercede on our behalf, and the Father always hears the Son. Pray then, pray without ceasing, an answer is sure to come. And then I spoke about the veil. The veil was embroidered with angels, right? Ascending and descending on the veil. Represents the fact that our prayers go up to the presence of God and the answers come back. We talked about the ladder that, uh, that Jacob saw in his dream. Not Jacob's ladder, but the one that he saw in his dream. Uh, angels ascending and descending. They take our prayers to, to Christ and then they bring back the answers from Him. So at the bottom of page 123, in what sense then did the little horn take away this function from the prince? Roman Catholicism has established a counterfeit priesthood to whom the faithful confess their sins. Is that correct? Yes. I know Don and Debbie used to be, well, at least Don used to be a Catholic, not Debbie. Uh, Debbie kind of uh, <laughs> set him straight. <laughs> uh, Roman Catholicism has established a counterfeit priesthood to whom the faithful confess their sins. 
That is to say, instead of the faithful directing their prayers to Jesus in heaven for forgiveness, they utter them to a human priest on earth who cannot forgive. In this way, the little horn casts down the intercessory ministry of Jesus in heaven and places it where? On earth. Even the faithful in Roman Catholicism offer their prayers to whom? Their petitions to Mary and the saints instead of to Jesus. In consequence, the attention of the faithful shifts away from Jesus who can truly hear their petitions and forgive their sins. Are you catching the picture? Yes. What did the papacy do? It totally obscured the work of Jesus Christ, His sacrifice, His word, His intercession, the fact that He gives the Holy Spirit for the church to shed forth the light. Everything was obscured by the papacy, darkened by the papacy. That's why the sun, the moon, and the stars are eclipsed. Are you with me or not? The Bible is clear that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus assured us that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father. No person comes unto the Father except by Him. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8, 34, that Jesus makes intercession for us. Furthermore, in words that are impossible to misunderstand, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. And 1 John 2 verse 1 says that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that we have one mediator between God and man. Why do we need mere human intermediaries when we can come boldly to the throne of grace through Jesus, the God-man? The confessional in Roman Catholicism focuses the attention of the people upon a man on earth instead of directing them to Christ in heaven. So in summary, two princes are struggling for the souls of human beings. One prince, Jesus, performs a continual ministry of salvation in the heavenly sanctuary by pleading his blood, the blood of His one and only sacrifice before the Father. That's the altar of sacrifice. That prince feeds his people with what? With the Word of God, the table of showbread. Keeps the light of the church burning by the power of the Holy Spirit, the candlestick. And forgives those who come to Him in penitence and prayer, the golden altar of incense. The other prince, Satan, unable to overthrow the heavenly ministry of the prince, establishes a counterfeit continual ministry on earth. The mass, tradition, the confessional, the pope, in the earthly temple of the church because he can't do it with the heavenly temple. By shifting the attention of the people from heaven to earth, he casts down the place of the sanctuary and prevents human beings from discerning what? The saving work of Christ in heaven. Not being able to discern the saving work of Christ in heaven, what happens with souls? Souls perish because in no one is there salvation other than in Jesus. No other name given to men on earth. Now let's talk briefly in conclusion about the darkening of the stars. The vision of Daniel 8 portrays a ram with two horns, a he-goat with a notable horn, and then four horns that come out of the notable, uh, when the notable horn is broken. Then a little horn attacks the host, and finally the prince of heaven. So you have a sequence of powers. You have the ram with two horns, the he-goat with the notable horn, four horns that come up when the notable horn is broken, then you have the little horn that extends, first of all, geographically, and then it extends to the host of heaven, and it attacks the prince of the host in heaven. Now, who is the host that this, uh, that this little horn attacks? Well, the host that it attacks, it can't be the angels, because these angels are in heaven. You see, in Daniel 8, you have an explanation of the vision. 
What I just described is in the first half of Daniel chapter 8. The second half of chapter 8 tells us what is represented by the host of heaven. It's not the angels. It's the host of Jesus living on earth, the saints. Notice the last paragraph, or the next to the last paragraph. The angel interpreter at the end of the vision explained that the two-horned ram represents what? The Medes and Persians. He then stated that the he-goat represents Greece, and its notable horn is its first king. Who is that? Alexander the Great. Next he informed us that four horns represent the divisions of Greece after the death of the first king. Those are the four generals of Alexander that fight for the territory that he left. And finally, the explanation portion of Daniel 8 tells us that a king will arise, which is parallel to what? The little horn, who will destroy the mighty and holy people. That's in the same position as casting down the stars in the vision portion. In the explanation portion it says, destroy the mighty and holy people. So what do the stars represent? The mighty and holy people. And then do you remember that also it said in the first, in the vision part, that he would attack the prince of the host? The explanation part says in verse 25, and he will stand up against whom? The prince of princes. So what is represented by trampling upon the host? It, represent, it represents destroying God's people. And by the way, in the vision portion of the vision, it says that he takes the stars and he casts them to the ground. So the explanation part tells us that the stars that the little horn throws to the ground represents what? Represents, according to this, the mighty and holy people. Even a passing glance of Daniel 8 indicates that the host and the stars of heaven in the vision is found in the same identical place as the mighty and holy people in the explanation of the vision. Thus the stars represent what? They represent God's people. Are you understanding this point? So now we've studied the first four trumpets. First trumpet is what? The destruction of Jerusalem. The second? The fall of the Roman Empire. The third? Oh, apostasy begins to enter the church in the periods of Constantine. The fourth trumpet? The period of papal dominion. And this is going to lead us to the fifth trumpet, which describes the French Revolution and the deadly wound that is given to the papacy in 1798. So tomorrow, I'm hoping that in two sessions that we have in the morning, we will be able to cover the fifth trumpet, and then we'll get into the most exciting part, which is the sixth trumpet of the book of Revelation. Revelation. 